Artificial intelligence. What are some of the major challenges posed by the revolutionary technology? And how are we going to deal with them? Hello, I'm Arnold Nido, and this is The Heat. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is transforming the way we live, but it's happening so quickly that it's also raising serious issues. One of them is the deceptive use of AI to manipulate and create video images and audio. They're called deep fakes. We begin with this report from CGTN's Mark New in San Francisco. Three years ago, this deep fake video of actor Tom Cruise went viral. The company Metaphysic created the video, and surprisingly, their co-founder, Martin Adams, is an intellectual property lawyer who's concerned about where deepfake technology is headed. There's a billion people voting, I think, around the world in the next, in the next year. Um, the AI is going to impact, you know, lots of parts of that. I think it's important, obviously, that people are able to trust the, the information that they receive. Metaphysic can now even do live face swaps. But it also offers services to scan your biometric data so that you can license and maintain control of your own virtual identity. There's too many companies who are maybe relying on gray or too kind of generous interpretations of things like fair use to make it saying that it's satirical, saying that it's funny, saying that it doesn't cause any harm. Um, I think we should have a narrower kind of interpretation of fair use and we should really insist on consent for these things to be made. Hey y'all, it's Taylor Swift here. Deepfake tech is now in the hands of almost anyone with a computer, allowing them to generate scam videos of a fake Taylor Swift selling products or create a video that captures actor Morgan Freeman's likeness and voice. I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. 30 seconds of your voice anywhere in the internet. I take that 30 seconds, I train the, I, the uh, uh, AI, I upload it, and then I have a transcript. And that transcript, when the AI read it, it's going to read it with my voice. That method has already been used to send robocall messages using a fake President Biden voice. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis have also all been the subjects of deep fake videos. I've realized I need to drop out of this race immediately. You know, the wrong video about, well, they killed that, you know, our leader, or he did this one, or they attack this or attack that. Then, then you're going to have, you know, the reaction of the public, and it's too late to tell them this is fake. So the right moment, the right time, it could have a tremendous impact on the movement or on the direction of events in the world. In February, 20 major tech companies, including OpenAI, Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, TikTok, and X, all signed the AI Elections Accord, which included a pledge to combat the deceptive use of AI in elections. Companies are taking action. For example, if I take to Microsoft's generative AI designer program and type in politician handing out ballots, here's what I get. I'm sorry, but I can't create content that involves politicians or political campaigns. These precautions may help some, but with so many different companies creating so many different generative AI programs, it's only a matter of time before some of these deep fakes fall through the cracks and require vigilant monitoring to root them out. Mark New, CGTN, San Francisco. As you can imagine, it's a fascinating issue. So let's get to our panel. Joining us from San Francisco is Amr Awadala. He's the founder and CEO of the generative AI company Vectara Inc. With us from Beijing is Andy Mock. He is a senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Also joining the discussion from California is Ray Wong. He is principal analyst and chairman of Constellation Research. And from New Jersey, we're joined by Dan Ives. He is managing editor of Equity Research at Wedbush Securities. Welcome to all of you. Ray Wong, let me start with you. As we heard in that report, deep fake technology is now available to almost anyone with a computer. And that's causing concern on how AI can be used to spread disinformation, say, during an election. Well, there's an election coming up in the United States right now, for instance. Question is, is it relatively easy to create these sort of scam videos or to manipulate images? 
and you wouldn't know how incredibly easy it is to create these videos. It is so easy. You could do it on your mobile phone. You could do it on a device. You could create a fake video in less than 30 seconds. That's what's so scary. And we have over half of the world electing their leaders this year. And that's what makes it even more complicated because you don't know if some photos could be diverted to the wrong polling station. People could be told that their leader had done something wrong. A scandal could break out out of nowhere. This creates massive internal risk. And there are also external state actors that could play a role in all different elections to manipulate the public's confidence and trust. And Ray, as you say, this can be done in a very short space of time, 30 seconds uh, or less. Um, but the software that runs these things, is it uh, is the software pretty easily available? Oh, the software is easily available. You can actually use any creative software to actually create these fakes. You could use generative AI, which is the other piece allowing people to extend or actually change images, change locations. Uh, these images and locations, uh, they actually address shadows. They address the ability to look at layering. And so we have to get to a point where we look at watermarks or trust marks that are there. And we also need a system to establish what is it authentic video versus a non-authentic video. So right now, it's the wild west of trying to understand how AI is going to implicate on elections and, more importantly, play a role in misinformation, disinformation in this election cycle. Amar Abadalo, you know, we've been doing some research on what's out there and how this can be used and what we see already uh, online. Uh, I mean, let's take a look at how realistic these deep fake videos can be. This is an anchor on the... Um, the economic news network, CNBC, uh, the business network, rather. And he's having some fun with deep fakes. Let's watch. I'm being replicated by a stand-in actor to read this monologue, and then my appearance and voice is changed using artificial intelligence. So now that I've got your attention, let's send it back to the real Brian Sullivan as we dive deeper into this revolutionary technology. So, I mean, whether it's a voter or a consumer for that matter, I mean, how difficult is it to distinguish what's real and what's fake? It's uh, becoming harder and harder, to be honest. Uh, the technology is getting so good at creating these fakes. And that's why we need, uh, we need government regulations that uh, make it a penalty for people to do stuff like that. Uh, I give the analogy of uh, today it's easy to buy a color printer and print money. Right? We don't do that because it's illegal to do that. <laughs> and uh, I think we need more regulations around the same concept for deep fakes is to make it illegal. You cannot make a deep fake of somebody else without their explicit permission and their explicit approval. This was not a problem a couple of years ago because a couple of years ago it was very hard. Very few people could do it. It was very hard to get access to, to use. Now it's there everywhere. The other thing we need is we need the social media uh, networks like Facebook, LinkedIn, and others to also monitor the stuff that's being posted on them and uh, label it when it's a deep fake versus not. And they're all working on that. In fact, LinkedIn launched something very cool recently where if you post a fake profile image, like the profile image that you have on LinkedIn, if it's fake, they actually have a detector that is 99% accurate that detects that and blocks that profile. So we need more like that. We need more things like that. Amir, um, the, the other thing we see, the other thing that we are seeing right yep. now is, uh, and this was launched very recently by Open uh, AI, that's one of the companies involved in artificial intelligence. It launched an AI video generator called Sora. Um, let's take a look at the video of a woman walking down a street uh, in the Japanese capital Tokyo. Um, and if we look at this, I mean, it's it's realistic. She looks real. She's walking down the street. I mean, all this was created inside a computer. I mean, how... I think we have lost Amir. Let me, uh, let me get back to Ray on this. Ray, looking at this, um, I mean, how much of a revolution is this, this technology? It's being called generative AI. It's revolutionary. What generative AI does, it allows us to extend our imaginations. It allows us to extend creativity. In Gen AI, you notice in that scene, there were no shadows. Uh, the lighting was actually in the right place. Uh, it's very hard to tell if that was the real image of her or not. At any moment in time, you could remove the people in the background and the crowds. Uh, you could easily replace the signage. You could change what's on the signage. All that can be done in seconds. Things that took days to do can happen in seconds in generative AI. Well, 
glad to say that Amir is back with us. Amir, we were talking about that uh, video that was created mm -hmm. by uh, the generative video uh, generator known as Sora. We're looking at the woman there in Japan walking down a street in Tokyo. Um, question is, you know, wh wh what's, how do we detect what's real, what's not? Yeah, so, so, so that th in this case, I think this is okay because this woman doesn't exist. So this is not a deep fake. It's not a fake of a woman. It's just a fake of a scene uh, on a street. Uh, and the potential of Sora is huge. The potential of Sora is imagine any one of us mm -hmm. being able to create an amazing movie like E.T. or like The Avengers. Uh, leveraging something like Sora, and I think that's a positive thing in that yeah. case. As long as we clearly are saying whatever we are producing is being produced for entertainment and for fiction, not to uh, be used as this is real news and right. real stuff happening in the world. When you watch a sci-fi movie like The Avengers, there is tons of deep fake stuff happening in there, right. but it's okay because it's a movie, it's a fiction, that's fine. Yeah, and Amir, as I understand it, uh, all this requires is a very short text prompt, uh, which yep. you basically feed into the computer, and then it generates this video. Yep, yep. So you will be able to make a very good movie, uh, and about a year from now, you'll be able to make any movie you would like. You will describe the character, the plot, what you'd like the scenes to look like, and the movie will come out on the other end. This is the direction we're moving in. So I look at things like Sora actually as very, very cool and, and, and truly going to enable creativity across all humans, not just the few humans that have money to go buy a big studio and, and shoot a big uh, budget movie. Andy, uh, in that report from our correspondent in San Francisco, Mark New, um, it, uh, he showed us a bit there, interviewed a person who says that all you need to do is capture a few seconds of someone's voice, someone's audio. AI can replicate that. You can put words into that person's mouth, literally. Um, I mean, you know, cybersecurity is already a very big thing. I mean, there are companies that spend vast amounts of their budget uh, on cybersecurity. What are the challenges that that kind of technology poses? Well, I think it certainly poses uh, lots of challenges, Anon. Um, but I want to also say, and I might, may be in a minority here, um, but that we've seen this movie before, and not only once, but many, many times. So every time there's a transformative, disruptive uh, communication technology, and I would put these flavors of AI, generative AI, diffusion models that create Sora um, in this category, uh, we have these concerns going back to the invention of writing. Mm -hmm. So Socrates at the time worried uh, that it would undermine people's ability to memorize things, but also writing could be faked. How would you know that this was authentic? And uh, the telegraph, radio, the internet, of course, we've faced these similar challenges. And what I think is that uh, humans are incredibly adaptive, um, and our immune system, as it were, uh, will rapidly uh, evolve to be more skeptical. And I agree that regulation has mm -hmm. to play a very important part here as well. And so there are cybersecurity risks, but broadly defined, I think that these concerns are perhaps uh, somewhat overblown. Regarding elections, mm. at least for the American election, uh, I think most voters are actually not that persuadable uh, for either party to win. It's more about getting out the voters who are already committed to a particular candidate. And for better or worse, um, I think many voters in the United States uh, might not uh, yeah. be persuaded. Dan Ives, which side of the divide do you fall on? Are we reading a bit too much into this new technology? Look, I mean, this is a revolution. And I mean, it's something that's changing technology, not just now, but I think for the, for the coming decades. I think the panelists raised great points about you got to put guardrails from a regulatory, but, but also even states federal. I mean, in terms of deep fakes and what we're seeing, I think you're seeing some states make penalties, right? In terms of there needs to be consequences, but you know, I think the technology is almost going 100 miles an hour in the left lane in a Ferrari, mm -hmm. but the regulatory is going 25 miles an hour in a minivan in the right lane. Dan, you know, we're talking about the risks that this new technology poses, the danger, the challenges that it poses. But, I mean, aren't there also opportunities? You know, some jobs may be taken away by AI. I mean, that's expected. That happened with the computer revolution. But what are the kinds of opportunities that this technology offers? 
Look, it's a trillion dollars of incremental spend. I mean, this is a 1995 moment. It's it's a transformation we haven't seen in 30 plus years. And, you know, Ray's talked about that a lot, as well as the other panelists. And I think that's why the opportunities outweigh the risk. And I think you look at from a job perspective, actually, I think in the near term, jobs are created. Now, I'm not saying, of course, jobs will be lost on the other side. But this is a boom to the economy. And I think that's why right now, unless you have a telescope, it's hard to find uh, that recession. Ray, of course, news organizations are paying very close attention to the development of AI, to, the, to what's happening with fake videos and the kinds of opportunities those provide to spread uh, disinformation, misinformation. Uh, there's a clip we were looking at, and this is a clip showing the actor Morgan Freeman. Uh, this was in a report by a Canadian broadcaster. Uh, if we can take a look at that clip. If you can see, I hope to finish this talk show one day. Will the fake Morgan Freeman please stand up? I am not Morgan Freeman. And what you see is not real. So, I mean, as we can see, it's very difficult to sort of distinguish what's real and what's fake. Um, but, you know, we've been talking about putting in place some kind of regulatory mechanisms to combat this. Um, how will they work? I mean, if you have hostile actors out there who are determined to confuse the public. It's a great point. There are really three things that have to happen. Uh, one, we actually, as Dan mentioned and other people mentioned, that uh, we, we do need some kind of regulation. Uh, the important part is there are simple things we can do with our footprint, our digital footprint, our genetics, our likeness, our digital presence. Those should be granted as property rights. If they're property rights, we already have property rights laws that are statutes in every state. Once you determine those are property rights, you need to seek permission and you need value creation. And then we can apply all the other criminal laws against that. The second thing that needs to happen is uh, pl platforms have to understand what is authentic content. And using trust marks or the ability to actually recognize the actual authentic content actually helps and solves the problem. Because if you cut content that's not authenticated, then you're actually in a situation where mm -hmm. you might know or you might have a violation that's actually occurred. And then the third piece is the vigilance that's going to happen from the community and the crowd. We have to be vigilant. Everyone has to go out and be able to identify which ones are fakes or deep fakes or flagged for fakes so that the speed and spread of misinformation is halted. Uh, that's really the concern. And someone earlier made a good point. I think Andy was talking about get out the vote. Right, the get out the vote piece. I could say, hey, the election is over, or someone has won, or yeah. the polling station is somewhere else, and that creates a lot of confusion. Amar Awadala, you know, we saw in that report from our correspondent, he was talking about, you know, tech companies getting involved in this. Uh, and as he pointed out, OpenAI, Microsoft, Meta, TikTok, as well as X, uh, they've signed on to what they call an elections accord, promising that they will develop tools to combat. Um, the deceptive use of AI technology, the kinds of things that uh, Ray Wong was talking about uh, a moment ago. Um, but, you know, the other side of that is the economics of these companies. We know that they've been cutting staff, uh, especially in those teams that deal with the authenticity of posts, that deal with trust, uh, that deal with safety. Um, I mean, can they do the job? Yes, they can, because they, they, you're right, they have been cutting stuff because AI is doing that job instead of the stuff. That's, what, that's what's going on. So they are investing significantly uh, in detectors that can detect uh, AI factual deep uh, fakes. Um, uh, for example, Meta has allocated a $10 million award to researchers to if they come up with a new better detector algorithm. So many of them are really trying to say the only way we can solve this problem going forward is not to have by staff reviewing every single single thing because that's not going to scale. We need to have AI to beat AI, right? We need to have AI that can look at every single post mm -hmm. and detect whether it is uh, fake or, or not. So I believe they can. They can do that. But the problem is not that. The problem is the hidden networks. So there is the visible social networks like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. But then there's the hidden social networks like Telegram, WhatsApp, where we send stuff to each other. They don't see that. That, that not, They can't block that. That's going from one person to another person. So there is no way for them to intervene and block that post from, from spreading. And this is really where the real danger lies. Mm -hmm. And that's why we still need things like regulations that prevent, that, that, that inhibit bad actors from even generating defects like that. There need to be severe penalties for doing that. And we need to increase the education and vigilance of the, the consumers to realize when something is a defect versus not. And not just take everything at face value. 
Andy, talking of regulation, I mean, it's not just a localized thing, isn't it? It's not just national regulations that are needed. We need some kind of international cooperation. I mean, just a few days ago, the United Nations General Assembly approved the first UN resolution on artificial intelligence, and that resolution calls for technology to be, quote, safe, secure, and trustworthy. All 193 members of the General Assembly signed on uh, to that. Um, so, uh, to that uh, resolution, uh, and China um, and the US and G20 nations are moving towards AI regulations. I mean, how important is international cooperation going to be? Well, I think, Anon, international cooperation is absolutely essential um, for a couple of reasons. So we've spent a lot of time today talking about the risk, uh, disinformation, misinformation. Um, and I think having global standards is very important because information today truly is borderless. We can send messages, text, voice, video anywhere around the world essentially for free. So I think it is very important. But the devil, of course, is in the details. And I think another important aspect of this um, is that this is not just an information revolution. It is also at the same time an industrial revolution. Because we are talking a lot about the digital aspects of artificial intelligence, but we're also living through an age where AI is going to merge with robotics. And we may see uh, not only an age of infinite abundance in terms of goods and services as robots are able to manufacture everything we need, mm. provide mm. the services we need. And this raises equity issues as well within societies and across mm. societies. And I think this is also a part of the issues that the UN is looking to address um, to make sure that uh, certain stakeholders, certain countries are not disproportionately advantaged or use AI to withhold the benefits of AI-powered development from other countries. So I think it's a very important uh, initiative that countries work together, but I think it's also going to be very challenging uh, at the same time. Right. Dan, I, these AI applications, I mean, they, they're pretty wide, aren't they? They can be used in almost every part of our life. I mean, it can range from basically what I'm doing here right now, sitting in a television studio talking to you. It can be used in the stock market uh, to predict trends. It can be used in financial markets. It can be used at home when someone's baking something, for that matter. So what kind of impact do you think it's going to have overall on the global economy? Um, and, you know, one also has to think of the kind of impact it would have on, on poorer nations. I mean, their fear is that it could lead to inequality um, uh, or, you know, it might disproportionately favor rich countries, even rich corporations. Look, I think there's a lot we don't even know today because this is a revolution. I mean, I, I'll call it a fourth industrial revolution, but we're even going back, you go back 70, 80 years in terms of what we're seeing in terms of the impact, just in terms of what this is going to look like, to even have some comparative. I think on the enterprise side, that's really the first wave that we're seeing today from Microsoft to NVIDIA and others. But on the consumer side, we haven't even started. From a use case perspective, I mean, Apple, we believe, will come out with their AI You know, in June. You look at how Meta's going after it. You look at a lot of other social media players. The regulatory, a lot of that's going to be self-regulation, mm -hmm. not necessarily from a government, local, or you know, yeah. federal. But I think this is something where it is a new age that's starting. There's going to be massive benefits, but ultimately, you're right. I think the strong get stronger in mm -hmm. terms of within big tech. They're going to just further flex their muscles with really owning the AI, at least in the near term. Ray, there is another um, fear or another challenge, and that is, you know, could we become over-dependent on AI? And could that lead to sort of a lack of creativity? Could it lead to the fact that we won't be thinking critically anymore? Um, I mean, could it even lead to a loss of, you know, what's inherently us, human intuition? It is a great point, right? I and mean, almost everything we do and every process we do, we have to ask the question, when we have full intelligent automation, when do we augment the machine with a human? When do we augment the human with the machine? And when do we trust human judgment? And 
the ability to learn things comes from pattern recognition. We repeat things, uh, we do things over and over again, we start to see patterns, we get smarter, we get better at it. And so we still have to do that level of training at the human level, uh, and then hopefully automation takes over and AI takes over and, and that, that part begins. But there's been some interesting studies where they've actually tested mm -hmm. companies who have actually tried innovation with AI and have innovation without AI. And it turns out that the companies that were using AI, it's not conclusive, this has been some tests that have been going on, um, had less creativity because they tend to go with the answers that the AI suggested and they didn't think outside of the box enough. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of danger, you're right on them, but you know, there's other things that may be happening uh, as we get used to learning AI and of course, seeing things outside of the box. Right. Uh, Amr Awadad, you know, there's another risk that we hear about. At, at the moment, it's in the realm of science fiction, but people do talk about it. And that is, you know, the impact that AI could have on human intelligence. I mean, could it surpass human intelligence? Could it really, realistically pose some kind of threat, existential threat? Uh, there's no doubt it will surpass human intelligence. That, that is now clear. It will surpass human intelligence. The question is when. We have lost Amir. Um, let me go to Andy Mock. Um, Andy Mock, you know, we, we're talking about the impact of AI, and we're talking about, as I said, you know, it could impact various aspects of our lives. But if we look at the impact it has, say, on the digital economy, on healthcare, I mean, the positive, these are the positive things that AI can be used for, for finance, intelligent manufacturing. I mean, how transformative will, say, AI be for a country like China? Well, I think it will be incredibly transformative. So, you know, if we go back to this idea that um, AI might change what it means to be human, um, because humans in the age of reason have, we define ourselves by our ability to think, our ability to be intelligent. And if there is a new class of being uh, that surpasses us, I think this raises profound philosophical questions. And actually, China, I believe, is very well suited because of its rich, long philosophical tradition going back thousands of years uh, to address this. On a more material level, uh, China, of course, uh, is a global leader in manufacturing and in industrial automation. So we see the integration of artificial intelligence with robotics, especially for industrial applications like smart factories. Again, we might see a world of infinite material abundance uh, that very well could usher in uh, Karl Marx's dream of a, a utopia where no one has to be forced to work for physical survival. Right. Here I would agree a little bit with uh, what the pre one of the previous uh, guests said, yeah. that I don't think the big tech companies will amass all the power. Uh -huh. I mean, we see what's going on in China. It's the government that is balancing right. these different interests. Uh, okay. This will work out well for everyone. Okay, we are going to have to leave it there. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C.